everyone, welcome back. This is Dr. Calkins, and now we're going to get into chemistry uh, and the types of matter that make up the world, as well as how that matter can change from one thing to another. So when we think about matter, what we have to really worry about is what is something so that we can know what nothing is. So when we think about matter, we have to think about the smallest part of matter, which is what we call an atom or an element. Um, so imagine if you take a piece of hair and you cut it into a million pieces, this would be kind of side by side by side. Um, so vertically, when the hair is held vertically. If you were to cut that piece of hair in half, that would be tough. Try cutting it into a million evenly spaced pieces. Again, this would be side by side by side by side. One of those pieces would be matter. So when we say what is stuff around us, we're saying what is everything that we can see because we can't see that one millionth the size of a piece of hair that we call an atom. And that's really what we're after. So even though this is the first chapter, it tends to be very difficult because now they're going to say what is everything around you and the chance of you knowing what everything around you is is very unlikely. You're going to know a lot of stuff based on your hobbies, based on some background knowledge that you may have had from other courses, but it's very unlikely that you know a little bit about everything, and that's really what they're asking in this chapter. So let's give you a better process at how to understand matter, and then at the end we'll talk about how matter can change. So as we look at matter, what we have to worry about again is anything that occupies space. So since we can't see that tiny space between atoms, that one millionth the size of a piece of hair next to another one millionth the size of a piece of hair kind of distance, we basically just have to look at everything and say, what is it? And that's what we're after. So if we look at our textbook, we see that it has maybe a spiral binding or a glued binding. Uh, it has pages of paper. It has colors of ink. All of those different things, all of those different colors, all of those different textures um, are different atoms and molecules stuck together in some kind of a mixture that we'll have to deal with. Even air is difficult to think about because when you look across the room, it might look empty. It's not really empty because if it's empty, we'd be suffocating now and uh, eventually die because we'd have no oxygen. Not to mention we wouldn't have any pressure, so then our bodies would distort because there'd be no molecules pressing on them, so they'd start to you know, swell up, so to speak, as if we were in a vacuum. So we know that in air there has to be oxygen, otherwise we die. More than likely there's lots of carbon dioxide because that's what we as living organisms turn oxygen into is carbon dioxide. So every time we exhale, that comes out. But there's also things like nitrogen, things like argon, things like radioactive radon that we'll uh, learn about in week four. Those are the kinds of things that are there that we can't see. Uh, although in labs, we can see some radon and its uh, background radiation in particular. But there's numerous things in the air, whether it's molecules from perfume or cologne or you know, some kind of shampoo or lotion that somebody next to you uh, or yourself put on this morning um, or throughout the day. So there's lots of things that can be in that air, just as well as the air handlers, the air conditioners, the heaters moving that air around. So there is lots of stuff there. We can feel it. But what's most important is it's lots of stuff. We can't see it because it's all mixed together. And that's one of the things that we have to worry about in this chapter is, is it a mixture or is it a pure substance? Pure substances are very specific to knowing what a pure substance looks like, which is very difficult to know if you don't know what every element or compound looks like. Um, you know, many metals are gray, many compounds are white, and that's one of the disadvantages of uh, the criminal justice system is if you have a white powder, maybe it's not sugar, maybe it's cocaine or methamphetamine or something of that nature. So pure substances are something that are going to be difficult to understand because, or at least to recognize visually because they look very similar to elements in some cases. Some of them might be white or yellow or gray, but it could be things mixed together that cause that color. So that's something we have to worry about as we start to practice uh, types of matter. Mixtures, uh, one of those is going to be easy. The other one's going to be tough. Um, and that's really because mixtures either look the same or they look different. So let's talk about those um, as we think about how they look. Can they look like compounds? Can they look like elements? And the answer is yes. So to narrow down our choices, one thing we have to look for first is our elements. 
If we hear the name of an element, we're going to know very quickly that it's something that we can match to a periodic table. So if somebody says, here's some silver, we take for granted that it's silver. We look at the periodic table and we see that there is no silver SI, that's silicon, but there is an AG. And that's our gentum for shiny in Latin. Um, so it is there. It may take you a while to find it. But silver is an element on the periodic table. So um, something like that would be an easy kind of answer to look for because it's labeled. And we take for granted that if it was a chunk of metal that was shiny and it looks like silver, that we'd assume that it was silver. We'd have no other way to, to recognize that if there's no numbers provided on it or stamped into it. Another thing to look for for... Certain examples of compounds in particular are things like the ATE, the ITE, or the OSE kinds of suffixes. Anytime you end in an ATE or an ITE or even an IDE, many times those are compounds uh, where you have a metal or a nonmetal, or you have lots of nonmetals together, as is the case for carbohydrates that tend to end in OSE. So anytime you see a recognizable suffix, sometimes you can get a clue very quickly that that could be a compound and definitely not an element that tends to end in an I and E or uh, something of that nature. Um, one of the things we also have to worry about is if it's a mixture, it could look the same or it could look different. So things that look the same, we would call homogeneous, meaning that they were mixed together, they look exactly the same left to right, top to bottom, front to back. If that's the case, they have synonyms. One of the synonyms for homogeneous is a solution. Another one is an alloy. Solutions are things like uh, stirring salt into water or sugar into water. You can't see the sugar or water afterwards after they've been stirred because they look like water. They won't taste like water anymore, but they'll definitely look like it. So because they look like it, but they have ingredients inside, ingredients is a great way to recognize homogeneous, assuming that they've been well stirred and now it all looks the same as a result. There is nothing that settles to the bottom, that floats on top, or that is suspended uh, in the middle. And then we have heterogeneous, which is really the only easy one out of the four categories. The reason it's the only easy one is because it looks different. Anything that looks different would be two different elements, two different compounds, elements and compounds. And if that's the case and it looks different, that's going to be one of the easiest choices for us to determine because heterogeneous Hetero meaning different, that's definitely going to look different left to right, top to bottom, front to back. So there could be something floating on top. There could be something uh, you know, that sank to the bottom of, our, of what we thought was a solution. But if there's something that's different about it, like something that sank to the bottom or something that's floating on top like ice, um, something that's suspended in the middle like CO2 bubbles and soda, those are kinds of things that would make heterogeneous mixtures. Um, and as you think about homogeneous, again, just think about this idea of solutions. If it has ingredients, think about going to Walmart. If you go to Walmart and you look at things that are on the shelf, almost all of those things are going to be some kind of mixture. Whether it's, you know, powders of certain things you put into drinks, um, whether it's, uh, um, you know, even fruits and vegetables, because they look different, they have different shapes, they have different textures. Maybe their peel is different from their, you know, their... Uh, you know, like an apple has a may have a red or a green peel, but it's you know yellow underneath. Those are definitely different things, making them a little bit more easy to recognize as a heterogeneous mixture. So as we look at clues for mixtures, sometimes we can look for numbers. Oftentimes numbers are given to solutions. So gasoline is a great example because gasoline has numbers. So when you look at a number for gasoline, uh, just the fact that it has different choices of 87 or 89 or 93 or whatever, that tells us that gasoline has a mixture of something. We don't need to know in chapter one what that mixture is. Maybe you know a little bit about gasoline because you like to race cars and you know that octane makes it go faster. So it is a mixture of octane, but the fact that it is a mixture of stuff, that's what we're after in this chapter. Other things like uh, gold, gold has numbers, 14 karat, 10 karat, 24 karat. You have to be careful with those kinds of numbers because 24 karat gold is the real deal. That's why it's the most expensive. But when you have 24 karat gold, you can uh, wear it very thin, putting it in and out of your pockets over the years. Uh, if you're not careful, you can slap it down on the table or uh, against your significant other's head and then 
uh, possibly bend it because it's soft. That's why so many countries and civilizations use it and stamp their images into it over the years. Um, so you can strengthen it by adding um, things like copper, zinc, and nickel, uh, even silver to change its color slightly um, to give you the 14 karat golds and the 10 karat golds that are cheaper because you're using cheaper metals to fill in some of that gold in its alloy form. So alloys, things that have elements mixed together but look the same in the end are still mixtures, but because they look the same, they're homogeneous, not heterogeneous. Heterogeneous would be more like a diamond ring. You can see the diamond, you can see the gold. That's two things that look separate. Um, that's two different elements. Um, those are kinds of things you could recognize as a heterogeneous mixture. So here's a few examples. Let's walk through these real quick. So when you think of a piece of wood, think about the way the wood looks. Anytime you have wood, you have wood grain. And the reason that we have two different names, wood and wood grain, is because they look different. So any type of wood is going to have bark. That's going to be different. They're going to have roots. They're going to have leaves. Those are different you know, types of the things of the tree. So definitely those look different. So definitely heterogeneous there. What about iron nail? Well, iron, you can look on the periodic table. Uh, just be careful that things may not look like they seem, because when you look for IR, you're going to find iridium and not iron. Iron is Fe ferrum, uh, another Latin-derived element. Um, so be careful. Uh, you'll have a periodic table with names on it, so just find it, and you'll find it uh, pretty quickly um, if you look in the middle. So iron is definitely a element, and because of it's an element, nail just determines its shape. So whether it's a horseshoe or a nail, it's just an element. Um, so that one we can definitely say is a pure substance and specifically an element on the periodic table. Rusty iron is a little bit different. Um, rusty iron, we have to worry about what is rust. Well, rust looks different than the nail, the iron itself. So if it looks different, we know it's heterogeneous automatically. So that brownness, that redness, that orangeness that you typically associate with rust, specifically of iron, that corrosion process therein is definitely different from the original iron nail that's still probably underneath, it's still probably shiny if you kind of scratch it away or wire brush it. So definitely a heterogeneous mixture there. If you stir together food dye and water, just like Kool-Aid minus the sugar, it's gonna look the same. It's gonna look like a solution, so that's homogeneous. If you look at beeswax versus candle wax, the fact that they have different names means that they are different. If you chop them up and throw them together into a bowl, they're probably going to still look different because they still are different types of candle, types of wax. However, if you melt that wax together, you're going to take that heterogeneous mixture from letter E and turn it into now homogeneous because if you melt them together and stir them together, they're going to look the same like Kool-Aid, stirring sugar together and so forth. So as you look at those, just remember that there is a process. Is it on the periodic table? Is it not? That's probably step one. Uh, another possible step one could just be, does it look different? That could be a very easy way to get rid of heterogeneous or apply heterogeneous very quickly. But if it doesn't look different and it's not kind of labeled from the periodic table, then we have to worry about, does it look the same like a compound, like a homogeneous mixture? The only way to really know that is to look for numbers. Numbers tend to guide us towards homogeneous um, because it's telling us what's in the solution. Things like diluted or concentrated um, are good examples of that. Um, so just be careful uh, as you identify some of these. You have to really worry about uh, what something's made of. And in our class, we have to know what everything is made of, which makes that even a little bit tougher. Elements themselves, again, just you have 118 choices. So take your time you and kind of survey through it. This period table is a little bit old. Um, we have some of those at the bottom filled in now, uh, but all those are radioactive, so we don't really have to worry about those. Most of what we deal with in intro chem is in the top three or four rows of the periodic table. So it either matches the periodic table or it doesn't. That's a pure substance. That's an element. Uh, elements are made of atoms in their singular form. Most elements have um, either one or two letters. So the capital letter is always first. But because we only have 26 letters to the alphabet and there's a lot more elements than 26, we're going to have to have some duplicates. There is no longer any elements that have three letters using their Latin base numbers. Uh, they all have either one or two letters now because they're named after people or 
famous places upon their discovery. As we look at atoms, the idea of an atom really was uh, something that came about a long time ago uh, with Democritus. He came up with the idea of an atom. He called it a tomos at the time. Democritus uh, may be famous for democracy, but not so much his idea of an atom. But Aristotle, much more famous philosopher, made it famous. Um, he didn't really change much based on the idea, but he said that they were indivisible, meaning they couldn't be divided further. And we'll find out in chapter 2 that's not completely true. But Aristotle's idea, because he was so famous, stood for 2,000 years. You can imagine how much has happened in the last 50 years. What if we wouldn't have believed a smart guy for 2,000 years? So sometimes science uh, in its dark ages didn't have a lot of progress because they believed really smart people. And it's good to believe really smart people, but you should also challenge them to come up with new ideas and to prove them. And that's where scientific method comes in uh, later in this chapter. So eventually we could see atoms. This wasn't until the 1980s with IBM looking at their uh, microchips. So what we're seeing here is what looks like an egg foam mattress, but this is just silicon atoms on a, uh, a microchip. Um, to get this image, it had to be pretty late at night, so say 3, 4 a.m. when there was no movement in the building because the resolution would be lost. So this image was found very late at night um, when the air handlers, the janitors, were not moving about because even if that entire floor was vibrating the microscope, you wouldn't see this image at all. It would just lose its resolution. And that's because atoms are small. And when atoms are small, we have to worry about, um, again, who are they? What are they? If you have just a singular element, that's something you can find on the periodic table and recognize its name on the periodic table. If it's a compound, it just means there's more than one capital letter for us in our first chapter. If you have more than one capital letter in its chemical formula, that means it has more than one element. If they're chemically bound together, there's multiple ways to do that, and that's later in the semester yet. But if there's multiple capital letters and they're chemically bound together, uh, that's definitely a compound, and that's a chemical formula. So chemical formulas have subscripts. That just tells you how many of each atom. Uh, nothing too difficult there. So if you look at water, it has two hydrogens, one oxygen. Whereas sugar, a complex uh, disaccharide from a later chapter, it's going to have 12 carbon atoms, 22 hydrogen atoms, and 11 oxygen atoms. But individually, those subscripts tell you specifically the capital letter, the capital letter, lowercase letter in front of them, how many are attached to that specific compound, that specific molecule. Here's a visual example to kind of finish up this mixture idea, uh, this idea of what is water. Uh, well, when you think about what is water, you have to think about the types of water. Tap water is different from spring water, different from mineral water, different from pure water. If it's pure water, we have to take for granted that it is just H2O. H2O is two capital letters, so that's a compound. If it were any other type of water other than distilled water, which would be another name for pure water, so any kind of uh, tap water or spring water is going to have hard water ions dissolve in there that you're going to see if it's evaporated. Um, that would be a homogeneous mixture. But pure water would be a pure substance, in this case a compound. If we add some lemonade powder and stir it up, it's going to look the same. So because it all looks yellow, we could say homogeneous in that situation. However, if we try to make our lemonade the old-fashioned way by squishing lemons and putting it into water, that pulp is different and that makes it now heterogeneous. So those are ideas that can help us understand, um, again, that process of, is it on the periodic table? Um, is it looking different? If it looks the same, you have to really worry about, does it have ingredients or does it not? If it has ingredients, it's definitely a mixture. If it's just a bunch of stuff that looks the same that's called salt, then maybe it's just sodium chloride, which ends in a very specific suffix that we can recognize as a compound. If we were to see the formulas, it's a little bit easier. Two capital letters is a compound. Uh, one capital letter is elemental, so just a pure substance. So this is the case for iron oxide, F and O. E is just along for the ride to help you distinguish it from fluorine, which is capital F. Uh, ozone, O3. So that and iron both have, and B and C both have, a capital letter only, not two. So that's just elemental. Uh, that's pure. Those are elements in the periodic table, although ozone has three atoms of the same element. Carbon monoxide has two capital letters, propane 
as uh, two capital letters. So in all those situations, the compounds are the ones that have multiple capital letters, and that's what we're looking for. And then in a separate video, we're going to cover changes. So we'll see you then.